reason we decided to talk about OPSEC today is because we are tired of OPSEC talks. We have been checking many materials during a long time, and we couldn't find the answers to the questions that we have. Basically, most of these talks cover technology, they cover uh, techniques, they cover tools, but from our point of view, they are quite unrealistic. That's why we decided to create this talk and cover all these things that we couldn't find in other talks about OPSEC in the past. We are people, we live in an analogic world, and there are a lot of situations that we don't know how to deal with. And we haven't been taught, we haven't uh, been trained how to deal with them. And we believe when it comes to OPSEC, we really need to know how to deal with these situations for not freaking out and giving all of our information to other people. We think that most of the uh, advices that we find about OPSEC are quite unrealistic. It's difficult for you to, after just seeing one OPSEC talk, just talk to all your community and decide to apply like a military grade OPSEC. This is not gonna happen. And it's not a matter of tools. So what we want is to offer some very simple, some very realistic advices that we think that will work for you. So you can apply them when you find yourself in such situations. I don't know if any of you like basketball. Do you like basketball? Nobody? <laughs> okay. So in the NBA Finals, Chicago Bulls played against Detroit Pistons. Detroit Pistons at the time were not so good team, and they were playing against, against the best player in the world, who was Michael Jordan. So just imagine you are in the Detroit Pistons, here is Michael Jordan, and you need to defend him. What would you do? Freak out. No way I can stop this guy. So they decide, okay, what we will do is to apply very simple rules. This is known as the Jordan rules, and they won the finals. Basically, these rules were very simple, like put your hands in his face when he's shooting, or in his balls, whatever, just stop this guy with very simple rules, and they won the finals. So basically, we want to create our Jordan rules for OPSEC. This is the objective of this talk. OPSEC comes from the military, it's a military term. Basically, it's about hiding your information from the enemy, or providing fake information to use it in your advantage. The fake information is counterintelligence. We are not covering this, uh, this, in, this in this talk. We are just talking about how to uh, deal with uh, not providing your information to your enemy. We are not talking uh, about enemies, it's about adversaries in this case. It could be anyone, but we can barely divide them in two groups. Adversaries with resources, and adversaries with no resources. But it doesn't mean that adversaries without resources are not dangerous. You can imagine some small group that is having some um, cyber campaign and you are dealing with them, you are uh, disrupting their operation. And then you publish in Facebook. Then this, and these guys will come to you and they, will, they, they can be dangerous for you. So always remember that the, the first rule of OPSEC is silence as a uh, security discipline, but our advice is that for these small adversaries, do not provide them information for free. Do not go to Facebook and publish, I just broke into this server and I stopped this operation from these guys. They could be dangerous. So we are dealing basically with agencies in this talk. These are the most powerful adversaries, and basically these are the adversaries you have more chances to interact with uh, during your life, your uh, personal life. Uh, uh, basically, agencies use mass surveillance because it's the most, uh, the, the most effective way for them to obtain information. Against mass surveillance, there is not much you can do, but you can do something that is encrypt everything. And you can see how every single time that something happens in the world, security, uh, sorry, the politicians they state that, okay, this will have not happened if we were able to uh, not have an encryption, if we were able to stop encryption. And having access to all communications, our intelligence guys will have been able to stop these guys 
Encryption is for terrorists. We hear that all the time. And the reason is because it's one of the left things that we have, so please use encryption. And here you can see the uh, different uh, protocols, different tools that according to Snowden leaks, the NSA was not comfortable dealing with. This is from 2010, so maybe at this time it's different, but still, please use encryption. However, there is one problem with encryption. Everything that you are encrypting today, you should assume that it has been recorded. At, in the future, if someone has access to your passwords, to your keys, to your private keys, they will be able to decrypt this, and this can bite you back. So you should consider that it's not necessary for these guys to break the encryption algorithm for get access to this data. They have many methods for having access to your password. And it could be physical methods. It could be a security camera. It could be someone spying on you. Or they can just, uh, police can just beat the, the, the password out of you, like in this example. And they can have access to your encrypted information. So basically, this is uh, something that we should take into account when we are just relying on encryption. So let's go uh, now for the, all these uh, situations in real life that we want to tell you about in this talk. And we want to tell you how you should react, or how you can react so you don't freak out and you know what to do in them. Check, check. So I want to talk about those gray areas that probably we are neglecting. We are talking about our position from, uh, we are security researcher, right? So probably based on our placement and access, that is where we are working and what information we have access to, we are, or we could be a person of interest. So we were interested in to know how this process works, the recruitment process. It's not crazy to think that at some point these adversaries will try to uh, recruit you. So basically, if you are a person of interest, they will try to uh, identify you, spotting you, and profiling you. They will study your motivations, they will study your ideology, your needs, your affiliations, etc., etc. And from there, they will decide an approach. It could be something so simple, just someone approaching you and saying, okay, uh, we win, I will uh, provide you money in exchange for information. They can play with your ego too. For example, saying, hey, we need this information, but probably you are not the good person to have it because you are not so cool. You are not that cool investigator. In the other way, the other hand, take into account that probably the adversary itself uh, won't be the one approaching you. Probably they are going to use proxies. So, this is for obvious reason, plausible deniability. And also take into account that when I was talking about profiling, part of this profiling will be from open source intelligence. So again, as my colleague said, don't, uh, don't, get, don't give them information for free. So try to keep a low profile. In any case, when, you, when we are in this type of situations, our objective should be move to determination. So what's termination? Basically, to finish that situation in the cleanest way possible for us. Of course, dissuasion or deterrence, it's your best option. So basically, showing them that you are not the good asset. You are a waste of time and resources. So this is our best option. But remember, we are talking about really powerful people and really, really professional in this field. Probably they know better how to deal with humans than machines. So take that into account. And of course, we are not trained in this type of situations. So let's talk a little bit about what alternatives do we have in these situations after uh, dissuasion. The first one is just to refuse. Yeah, if you think that someone is suspicious, I, I don't want to collaborate with you. But this is really, really difficult. Unless you are a sociopath, it will feel you uh, yeah, uncomfortable. And also, you don't know if they are going to come back again and again and again. So let's talk about the interesting uh, alternative. That is, refuse, but providing alternative. So basically, redirecting the request to another person that ideally should be more prepared than us to deal with these situations. 
so a professional. So we need to have to, to have prepared an escalation strategy, so a strategy that could help us in getting out of this situation. This will save you time, will save you problems, and it will give you a peace of mind that you will need, especially when dealing with some unpleasant situation. For example, suspicious meeting. Imagine that you are in a really cool investigation, potentially state-sponsored, non-public, critical, and you have a request for government X to meet with you. The first recommendation, probably, it is uh, don't go alone. Remember, a little bit of peace of mind. But if you have to go, plan all of this stuff. For example, probably they, are, they will provide you, they will try to, to go to that meeting with you in, in their own transport. Don't, do not rely on, their, on that transport. If they say, for example, okay, we will pick you up at the airport and then we will go to the meeting or whatever, yeah, don't trust on this kind of transport. So go on your own and also study the place that you are going to what alternatives you have, safe places, etc. I think another cool thing to have prepared is a dead man switch. In the traditional sense, a dead man switch is a switch that is operated when the, uh, or it's activated when the operator is unconscious or it's uh, unavailable. In our case, it's something more simple. Just tell your colleague that, hey, I have this suspicion, I'm going to this meeting, if I don't contact with you in two, three, four hours, please uh, activate our uh, protocol for escalate these kind of things. It could be something so simple, just or call law enforcement or another type of uh, things that can help you. The other thing is that tell them that you are ready. It could be something so simple, just saying, okay, Guys, uh, after this meeting, I have the, another one with my colleagues in, in a place near here or something like this. So it, it, nothing complicated. Act, act natural. The other, why, the, the other thing to have into account is the trap. Perhaps it's not the meeting. Perhaps they want you to leave your computer in the hotel or in the box office in the building or something like this. So don't think that the meeting will be the final trap. So another implicit situation is, for example, uh, you are in that country and you see some suspicious patterns. So people following you, people with caps and phones around in your hotel, just taking a look. Okay, the first thing to remember is don't try to, add, to act that someone that you are not, right? We are not James Bond, we are not Jason Bourne, we are just security researchers, so don't try to worse the situation. In this case, preparation is also key. You need to have some uh, safe places. You need to go to uh, some safe, uh, safe places. It could be something like uh, a public place, uh, the airport, or ideally, if your level of paranoia is really high, go to your embassy or to your consulate. On the other hand, ask yourself what they want. Perhaps you are in the finishing that investigation and it makes no sense to, to hide the information. We have some references that a direct, that direct approach worked sometimes, but yeah, we believe that it's not the best option for us. The good thing to do here is inform your people. Keep your people informed at all the times about what you are doing. So let's talk about other situations on which are really vulnerable. And this is one of the most worrying for everybody. How to react in the airports? We're in the airport and we are through security and someone is asking for our computer, our laptop, and our cell phone, everything. Should we provide them with this? Should we give them the password? Is, is that, what's the legislation in this case? Our, just in short, is confusing and they can do whatever they want. Basically, I know that there are some laws, it depends on your citizenship, it depends where you are going, but basically there are exceptions, there are loopholes that they can apply. They can say, okay, terrorism or uh, country security, and basically in those situations, they have exceptions and they can do whatever they want. If you are asked, like, can, can I please take a look into your luggage, and you say yes, they don't need a warrant. If they find something suspicious, they don't need a warrant. Anyway. I tell you what you should not do. 
if they start taking a look into your stuff without your permission, do not stop them. This is a felony. If they ask you something, you don't, should, uh, you don't need to answer. But if you do, don't lie. This is a felony. So uh, at the end, there are these loopholes, like in the case of uh, David Miranda. He was carrying uh, some Snowden information. He is a, a Glenn Greenwald boyfriend. And uh, when he was stopped in Heathrow for three hours, sorry, for nine hours, after that there was a trial, and the judge said that the police did okay because David Miranda didn't know that his information was a piece of a bigger puzzle and this could threaten the security of the country. So you see loopholes. What is our advice? Our advice is be kind, be collaborative, don't freak out, don't make things worse. In such situation, you have this guy pressing you, you need to take your, you, you need to, to catch your flight, and you are nervous, don't freak out, be cool, don't make things worse, don't say something like, okay, I have nothing to hide, I will tell you everything. But don't be stupid, <laughs> just don't have anything with you. If you need to have some information at your destination, encrypt, put it somewhere, and download at your destination you shouldn't have anything with you. If there is no way and you really need to carry something, use VeraCrypt, use TrueCrypt, use LiveCD, use uh, anti-coercion password, and there is no way at the borders that they can know that you are hiding uh, something in such situation. Okay, did you realize that there is a common pattern in all of the situation, in almost all of the situations that we have talked? Basically, you, are, you need to rely on a external uh, help, and that's cool, or not. <laughs> so your company ideally should provide you with uh, a person of contact for when you are in trouble, international support, and of course a small briefing of the country that you are going to, although this is something that we knew that in a lot of companies it's, uh, it's already done, but we need that this small briefing to be uh, more adapted to our needs, right? We are not tourists. so. I think this is, uh, this is so important. But even if you have this type of external help, do not just rely on this. We need to do your homework. It will be you that will be in a very unpleasant situation, so it's okay to have that external help, but don't just rely on that. You need to do your homework. We decided to call this talk Krav Maga because we think that this martial art is very realistic and based on real life experience. And this is what we wanted with this talk, provide realistic approach to real life situations. Yeah. So as we said, uh, we are talking about our perspective about uh, as security researchers, so it's not a problem of tools, it's a problem of uh, discipline. Preparation and awareness, it's key. Of course, don't forget your role and try to act like someone you are not. And yeah, be the owner of your silence and not the slave of your words. Thank you. Thank you.